When building out your smart home, one of the most important decisions that you can make is how to access and control it. Most devices have some way to control their operation, be it buttons, a touchscreen, or a remote, but what really sets smart devices apart is connectivity. Smart devices can communicate over different types of networks with other devices on those same networks. Think about it as something like a neighborhood. Devices in the same network are in the same neighborhood, where every device knows where every other device lives. Connectivity is a good first step, but in terms of control, this can be a little chaotic. You have lots of devices talking to lots of other devices all at once. Imagine if your neighbors are suddenly standing at their front doors shouting that they're turning on the washing machine or they're cooking dinner. In this video, we'll talk about smart home controls and how to take all of that chaos and turn it into something useful. My name is Steve, and this is IT Alchemy. At the heart of it, controlling smart home devices is pretty easy. Nearly any product that you can buy nowadays has some sort of control mechanism, typically a mobile app or remote control. If you have one or two devices in your home, this really isn't a problem. If you're anything like me and you have so many gadgets that it makes your spouse question their life choices, then it becomes a little bit of a problem. Nobody wants to have 20 plus apps on their phone to control that light or this speaker. Nobody wants to have strategically placed remotes all over the house. What if you're out in the garage and you don't have your phone with you? What if you lose the remote or worse, it gets destroyed by a dog that particularly likes to heist Amazon Fire TV remotes? In recent years, voice control has become more prevalent. So much so that it's included in the most ridiculous things. Open can. This certainly adds to the convenience factor, since you don't need anything to control a voice-enabled device other than to just ask. One thing to keep in mind is that sometimes you'll have a device in close proximity to one another, and this can sometimes have unintended effects. For example, having a smart speaker in the living room and another in the adjacent kitchen could be a toss-up which device will respond. Another consequence you may run into is devices that give verbal responses inadvertently triggering other devices. Most voice-enabled devices also have difficulty understanding voice commands in noisy environments, or when complex commands are entered. Voice control can be a great thing to have, and I use it myself from time to time, but I wouldn't rely on it as a primary control method for the whole home. So where does that leave us? Dashboards. Dashboards are great because they consolidate multiple device controls into a single user interface. They can also provide at-a-glance information uh, to the state of the device, whether a light is on, the temperature that the thermostat is set to, even previews from camera feeds. In IT, we often have to monitor hundreds or sometimes thousands of servers and computers. There's no way that I'm logging into each machine to check on it. So we use dashboards to provide the information that we need. Now, individual devices don't typically have their own dashboards. Most companies are only concerned with selling their ecosystem of products with their own controls. So in order to consolidate, we need our connected devices to go through a single point, and that's where hubs come in. The goal of a smart hub is to take multiple devices and integrate them together into a single system. Hubs centralize control and allow you to create automations that interact with the connected devices on your behalf that are all connected to that hub. There are a lot of smart home platforms out there. Most have similar functionality, some are geared more towards specific niches, but let's go over the big players. The Amazon Echo devices were originally started out as smart speakers with voice control using a voice assistant called Alexa. It gradually developed into a control system with integrations for thousands of devices. If you have an Echo Show, uh, Echo Hub, or certain Echo Dot models, you can build automations called routines. Amazon Echo provides a basic dashboard uh, that's provided in the Alexa app on your phone as well as on the Echo Show models. I find that the dashboards are somewhat limited and not every feature of every device is exposed to the system. In most cases, compatible products were automatically detected and could be easily linked into your account requiring little to no setup. For example, if you have a capable Echo device such as an Echo Show and a ring camera labeled backyard camera, you could ask Alexa to say, show the backyard, and it would pop right up. It's pretty neat. In recent years, though, there's been a lot of changes to this branch of Amazon. 
features that were previously free or useful are either no longer available or have been rolled into a subscription-based add-on. The dashboard itself is also pretty basic and the routines for automations are limited in complexity, but I, I would still recommend it for certain people because of how easy it is to set up. For users that are heavily invested in the Apple ecosystem, Apple may be a good choice. It has a very nice looking dashboard, tight integration with other Apple products. The automations provided by the platform can sometimes lack some granularity, so don't expect to build anything complex. It uses an assistant called Siri to enable voice control for most devices. And the dashboard control can even be extended to wearables, such as an Apple Watch, which can be very convenient. In general, it's a fairly solid platform with good security and a focus on local operation. That means, for the most part, it doesn't require an internet connection to work, and the likelihood of features or functionality being killed off is pretty low. Of course, the trade-off here is that Apple is what we call closed ecosystem. The platform requires an Apple device, such as an iPhone or an iPad, for the initial setup, and if you want to use automations, you'll need a HomePod, iPad, or an Apple TV. It doesn't work well, or sometimes at all, with devices that don't have certified HomeKit support. Now that's not to say that it can't integrate with unsupported devices, but it will require additional hardware and software, and you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Google Home is another popular smart home platform. It has a clean, minimalistic dashboard that allows you to control over smart devices and other Google products, as well as a built-in voice assistant. In my experience, the voice assistant seems a little more capable of performing tasks and understanding you as opposed to either Alexa or Siri, and you have fewer dumb moments when it comes to knowing what it is that you want. More recently, Google has begun phasing out the Google Home Assistant in favor of its AI system, Gemini. This opens up many, many more possibilities for both virtual assistant tasks as well as home control. Because of the heavy reliance on AI for the virtual assistant, there's a need for the Google platform to maintain an active internet connection in order for most features to work properly. SmartThings, like Amazon, aims to provide a unified connection of devices within the Samsung slash Galaxy ecosystem. Unlike some other smart home platforms, Samsung makes a lot of the devices smart things would integrate with and you probably have in your home. TVs, refrigerators, ovens, microwaves, washing machines, the list is pretty extensive. The dashboard itself is sleek and uncluttered and it gives you a nice overview with a 3D representation of the devices within your home. It does have a voice assistant in a well called Bixby, uh, which probably nobody uses, and it also relies heavily on being connected to the internet for most things to function. Personally, I put smart things in the same category as Amazon, Google, and Apple. Uh, I believe in purpose-built systems, and while the big companies have sometimes produced some pretty cool stuff, I don't have a lot of trust that they won't kill off the product at some point or make a bunch of changes that keep me redesigning the system from scratch. Next up, we have Homey. Homey is a relatively newer smart home platform uh, within the last 10 years or so that aims to be an out-of-the-box solution for all of your smart home needs. It comes with uh, a couple of flavors. There's Homey Cloud and there's Homey Pro. The Cloud version is a subscription-based and performs most functions but only supports official apps to extend its functionality and requires the addition of a Homey Bridge to communicate with devices that are not cloud-enabled themselves. The Pro version is a completely local appliance that, while fairly expensive, offers pretty much every feature that you could want and is able to communicate over a variety of protocols. It allows integrations with third-party devices and supports community apps to provide even more usefulness. The dashboards themselves are attractive looking and it's very user-friendly. Automations are done using kind of a visual coding style method that makes developing extremely easy. I actually love this cute little hockey puck, and I've used it for quite a while, but I ended up dropping it due to LG's acquisition of Homey. I suspect the goal is to incorporate Homey's technology into the ThinkQ platform, but given some incidents in their track record and sometimes the overly complicated interfaces of their products, I think that's going to go in the wait and see pile. Next up, we have Hubitat. Hubitat's also a relatively new pro platform in terms of like the last 10 years or so, um, but new newish to the smart home world. And it's something of the opposite of Homey. It has similar features such as local control and dashboards, albeit maybe a little less polished looking than Homey. Hubitat has full rules engine to create automations with, so you can leave things as simple or as complex as you want. 
It also features some interesting systems for controlling things uh, collectively like lighting, thermostats, and security devices that can provide things like schedules and interactivity, even if the device itself lacks some of those features. Additionally, the mobile app allows for a remote control of the system, even though it's not cloud-based, and it can also act as a locator beacon of sorts for presence and geolocation. This is really cool because it allows you to build automations around whether or not you or another family member is at home. I will say that the automations do have a bit of a learning curve sometimes. Most natively supported devices integrate pretty seamlessly into the system, but adding functionality or support for devices outside of the ecosystem can be a little bit troublesome. Hubitat uses its own programming language called Groovy to create custom apps and device drivers. It's fairly easy to learn if you're already familiar with programming, but can be time consuming and a bit of a pain to pick up if you're not inclined. The last smart home platform I'll cover here is my personal favorite, and that's Home Assistant. Home Assistant is an open source, community-driven project. It is one of those widely used smart home community projects with over 2 million active installations and one of the most heavily contributed to projects in recent years. What that means is the development of Home Assistant is guided by the people that actually use it, and they freely share the things that they build with other users. This makes Home Assistant extremely customizable. You can customize your own dashboards, you can create simple or complex automations, and you can even use your own personal voice assistant. In terms of integration, you can connect it to pretty much anything, including other smart home platforms. All of this is done locally without ever touching the cloud if you don't want to. Now, you may have been doing your research and maybe you've come across some complaints that Home Assistant is a lot of work, and I'll have to agree with that. The sheer amount of customization that you can do with Home Assistant is just staggering, and it does take a lot of time to get everything working just how you want, but in my opinion, that's what makes it so powerful. Do it yourself, do it better. Choosing whether or not your setup needs a hub and which one to choose is a big decision. There are lots of considerations to make and ultimately which smart home platform you choose is up to you and your specific needs. Keep in mind that many platforms such as Amazon, Google, Siri, and Homey Cloud rely on an internet connection to function to their full capability. If your internet service is spotty, you might want to consider a mobile localized platforms such as Home Assistant, Homey Pro, or Hubitat. Also be cognizant of privacy. Some people really don't care if their data is out in the cloud or if their devices are exposed to the internet, but from an IT perspective, I really caution placing convenience over security. In general, most people aren't malicious enough to mess with your home, but don't make it easy for them. Control is the central point of your smart home system, so make sure that you choose something that's both easy for yourself, your family members, and even your guests to use. If you don't want to spend a lot of time tinkering, go with something easy like Amazon, Google, or Apple. If you're wanting to have the best of everything, I would definitely recommend Home Assistant. In the upcoming videos, I'll show you how to install and set up Home Assistant for the first time and go over some of the basic functionality. Hopefully you'll see how powerful it is and it'll inspire you to want to become a true IT alchemist. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to my channel for more updates. Thanks for watching.